I would first like to... uh, yes, I just mentioned that we are going to be recording this evening. If at any time you feel uncomfortable um, and want to ask a question, we can pause the recording. So just let us know. I'd first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're all gathering from this evening um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I think a few more will um, join us um, as we go. Um, so this evening, um, we are going to um, have some insights from Jen and Sally from Faulkner Commons and Lydia, who is um, an OFN um, employee, who is going to talk to us about price as well, which will be fantastic. And then we're going to have a Q&A session towards the end, which is um, why we're encouraging you to pop your questions in the chat um, so that we can get to them a little bit later on. Um, what um, this uh, webinar series we've called like peeling an onion and it's all about peeling back the layers of our community food enterprises and um, we've had this is the third of our series and so the actual webinar goes from six till seven this evening um, but then we invite anyone who would like to to join us for the seven till seven thirty which is just very much more of the open um, chat uh, if you feel like joining us you're most welcome um, it's kind of you know webinars obviously are hard we love the face-to-face -face events where we get to do the networking so that half hour kind of gives us a little bit of that virtually okay Firstly, um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Jen and Sally for joining us this evening. Uh, they're coming to us uh, from Faulkner Commons. Um, and yeah, firstly, would you like to introduce yourselves and um, explain a little bit about Faulkner Commons? Sure, we'd love to. Um, we're calling in um, from um, the Wurundjeri um, people's lands, um, the Kulin Nations up in Faulkner, and we too would like to pay our respects and acknowledge that um, prior to colonial disruption, they had food and land sovereignty. Um, you want to start us off? Hi, my name is <laughs> Sally Beatty and um, I'm the co-founder of Faulkner Food Bowls, which is a community market garden, and um, also Faulkner Commons, which is the food distribution hub, um, and, and Growing Farmers, which I'm vice president of, which is another new enterprise. Um, just a bit addicted to starting enterprises. And um, I have been a community development worker for about 12 years. I'm always in building community and working with people's strengths. Um, and mm, probably only in the last four years have really gotten into food systems. Yeah, and um, I'm Jen Ray. Um, I've been on the Faulkner Food Balls Committee since um, since its um, beginnings, and I'm also um, the co-founder and run Faulkner Commons, um, and also the director of Fair Share Fair. Um, I have a background in climate-related disaster preparedness, um, speculative futures, and food justice, um, and that's all done through research and creative projects. Sal's community development background and my research um, areas really um, provide a lot of the foundations um, behind Faulkner Commons. So just to context contextualize um, where we're coming from in terms of Faulkner Commons, um, Faulkner was one of the most heavily impacted, um, COVID impacted suburbs in 2020, where we had 181 cases and 43 deaths. Um, at the same time, um, I had just finished some research with the Open Food Network looking at food insecurity and the Food Hub Feasibility Study for Moreland Council. Um, and it was when we were um, when we were looking at what um, a lockdown, how a lockdown would impact our suburb, food security was a major issue for us. We'll talk about the dem demographics. Yeah, for those who don't know Faulkner, it's a really diverse suburb. 55% of the uh, community members were born overseas themselves. And we're about 25% Muslim um, residents as well. So it, it provides a really rich fabric of different cultures, religions, ways of life, and, um, and it, which provides challenges, but also real assets in being able to diversify our vegetables that we grow and all sorts of things. So in, um, in May, we realized that we don't have any groceries, major grocery stores in Faulkner. We've got poor public transportation. Um, we basically mobilized all of the sort of local food producers to find out what was happening in terms of um, having healthy food supply chains coming, 
uh, coming into Faulkner. And what we found out was that all of the food relief organizations had closed, um, that um, the market, like there was the community grocery market, they weren't able to operate, Open Table wasn't able to operate, and a lot of the local businesses were, were suffering. So um, in a Zoom conversation, we got 14 people up to the up, um, up online and we decided to start Faulkner Commons, which is basically operating uh, or was operating in 2020 out of the Faulkner Bowling Club. And that's where our food garden is located to the Faulkner Food Bowls. So we had a really good relationship with them. And also uh, quite a few of the other food initiatives had started there. Boom Foods, which was a cooked meals every Friday night. And also the whole Faulkner Whole Foods Collective was run out of the Bowls Club too. So there's a really good fabric there already, like a groundwork for this. Yeah, so um, in setting up it, one of the things about Faulkner Commons is that it has adapted almost week to week to changing conditions. And we have um, just a great groundswell of volunteers um, in the community that are willing to work with us. And so where we came from um, was basically, you know, creating food boxes, um, selling and organizing, aggregating and then distributing to the community food boxes that were packed on site and you know with no with no stock and then moved moved on but what we found within the third week of running Faulkner Commons was that um, many of our community members were in trouble um, from job losses um, we had a number of international students um, yeah it was it was across the board and we had people coming to us saying that they couldn't afford food and um, large families predominantly. In large families who were supported by the gig economy, particularly Uber drivers and the like, or um, import export businesses, and it just all fell in a hole. Yeah, so um, in the course of that third week, Sal mobilized a lot of local community growers, like backyard growers, and said, what, what can you harvest and what can you bring to us? And, um, and then started forming some relationships in the community to try and get food relief coming this way. But what was coming, for coming to us was not adequate or culturally relevant for the people in our community. And I, I would say it was kind of like the leftovers of the leftovers. And it was this moment where people were coming for food relief at the same time that we were handing out food boxes to other members uh, who were paying for the community. And there was that, that tension and a lot of sort of ethics and um, some really hard questions that we, that we explored during that time. And, um, and so what we ended up doing was developing um, almost like a two tier way of pricing and trying to, and what we were calling basically, you know, food with dignity. Um, and this came from um, my experience of being in Cuba about 15 years ago and looking at how, um, how they have two different economies. They have the American dollar and then they have the Cuban pesos, but everybody still has access to food. And it's just about making sure that, um, that those who can pay can, can afford and it supplements, um, supplements the food offerings for others. And so how we did this is we have um, on our shop, we have something called pay as you feel. Um, they're sorry, pay, um, they're called pay, sorry. Pay it uh, forward. Pay it forwards, we have both. Um, pay it forwards and you can buy different bunches of PIF. And, um, and what we found is that almost everybody who purchases from us um, also buys PIF. And that helps us to subsidize food boxes for people who can't afford paying. Then we would have a bunch of different programs um, where we would invite chefs to come cook in the kitchen and they would donate their time. And in donating their time, um, they would produce either what we have um, is small batch, which are things like hummus or tabbouleh salads or dips and so forth. Faulkner Commons would pay for the ingredients, they would donate their time and whatever the profits were would go to supplement um, the food boxes, the low cost food boxes. And then we had also, we had something called hump day takeaway. And so you could come and pick up your food box and then also get a meal. Do you want to talk that about was that? inspired by a partnership with Lentil as Anything that we did for nine weeks, right in the, um, 
in the when we were a COVID hotspot and it was real lockdown and people were desperate to have takeaway food and had limited offerings. So um, Lentil as anything said they'd come in and provide like their pay as you feel method. And um, there were always two options every Wednesday. And then when they finished up because their restaurants opened up again, we continued on with that um, hump day takeaway and uh, meant that people who were picking up food relief, the free boxes, were able to get a hot meal free at the same time and take it home for that night. But a lot of the community members were coming just for the hot meal and paying, you know, anywhere between $6 and $14 a serve, but um, and treating it like their regular takeaway for the week. And some of them were Faulkner Commons customers picking up paid boxes. Some of them weren't. Some of them were just coming for the takeaway. But all of that money went into the food relief again. So for free boxes for people. Yeah. And internally, like for us at Faulkner Commons, we, we didn't actually use the word food relief. Mm. We, called, we called it red boxes because very much it was about food with dignity and nobody knew who was paying. So you would come up and, and all it was like, we just had a color coding system for the different size boxes and the red ones were the ones that we would, we would bolster with extra produce or our baker would throw in the extra bread that was baked that day. Um, we had grants with the Inner North Foundation that supplemented with milk and our pay it forward, our bunches of pith would buy eggs. So And that, Faulkner Food Bowls on site was able to donate organic veg every week, whatever we had left over, we were able to put that also into the food boxes. Yeah, so now, you know, we're, we're still in the pandemic era here, um, but things did open up and the bowling club opened up as well and wanted um, wanted to be able to use it for their own programs. And so we, we had to look at how could we continue operating and meet the needs of the community, but also be sustain sustainable. So. We're very much in a transition um, period, but we're there's some exciting things happening. Hey, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, the community grocer left Faulkner. They didn't find it viable anymore. Um, they didn't think as a market they would make as much money as they had been through the box scheme. I know a lot of box schemes collapsed after after the COVID lockdowns, um, and then the bowling club wanted to be a bowling club again. So, we've had to adapt and. Um, and find other ways. And so we're working really closely with Faulkner Primary School. And that school had um, uh, allowed us to use their 11 raised boxes during uh, term three last year when they had no students to grow food relief in for, move, for moving feast. So we already had a relationship and they've said that we can distribute food from their um, grounds where they've got a covered space every Wednesday night. So we've just really moved pretty much 300 meters from the bowling club to the Faulkner Primary School. Um, and then at the same time, we're, um, we're exploring how, I mean, there's actually a couple of explorations that we have going on. One is transforming our residential house into the food hub. Um, and so, because we have growing farmers farming the backyard, we have a four cart garage and we've got two large spaces that we can use for packaging and food storing. And we're looking at converting the household kitchen into a commercial kitchen and three lockable bedrooms that can be office spaces for food um, initiatives so so that there and then also um, we're looking at different types of box schemes where we can still have that sort of two-tiered system but we can start working directly with farmers because we've really enjoyed the process of working directly with producers so now we're we're calling around and seeing how we can come up with a box scheme because we do um, we're very lucky that we have great volunteers who are keen to um, to keep food security and food justice at, at you know at sort of yeah. top priority. So we're lucky this year we've um, been working with Open Food Network to um, develop a system, the Faulkner Food with Dignity for Faulkner Commons, where there's um, a special code for customers who are getting the red boxes and they can be subsidised at any tier that we want. So we could, they could be subsidised 50%, 30%, or what, you know, whatever we choose. We're choosing to do 50% of the cost price and we're paying 50% of it with those um, initiatives that we use for uh, raising money. So because we build them in, the way that other people um, like, you know, who gives a crap knows everybody needs toilet paper so they can do a social enterprise and raise money through that. We know that everybody needs takeaway food and, and, and food items like, you know, hummus and things. So that's how we can raise that money and then supplement the um, the Food with Dignity program. And we're hoping to do that into the future by um, 
partnering with uh, Remy from Remy's Patch, who um, is going to deliver his uh, organic veggies every week for us to package up. And also um, down the track, we'd like to work with Open Road, which is the uh, Open Food Network initiative. So yeah, well, we haven't done packaging of our own. It was always the uh, community grocer who did who ordered in the veggies from the wholesale market and did the packing, but we much prefer this method of paying the farmer directly. And we've been talking to Edie Grocer and they've been supporting us a lot with you know, their model and they're very hyper-local like we are. We're pretty much just Faulkner and North Coburg and um, we love their model. So it's been good having a good talk to Jono as well. Yeah, so I, I guess in closing, like when we're thinking about pricing and so forth, we're thinking a lot about time, we're thinking about food justice and we're thinking about collaboration and uh, story and belonging. So, you know, um, and we do this through the programs, like through the different programs, but what we're trying to do is create a food literacy and an understanding with um, the people who are our customers um, that our pricing is, is in alignment with um, centering relationships and relationships with those who produce food, but those who also consume the food. So um, we're happy to take any other questions or anything like that, but I guess we can leave it there. Well, that's amazing. It's um, just such a beautiful story <laughs> um, of people who genuinely care about their communities. Uh, just it really warms my heart to hear um, and also just the, um, how agile you guys have been over the last 12 months and well, just just over 12 months. Um, and it's fantastic to see that you found ways to continue it and that it's, you know, continuing to develop into something that sounds like it's going to become a really sustainable enterprise. Um, so I'm really keen to watch how it develops. I'm sure most others are too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you. joining I us. Something I forgot to mention is that we um, also relied so heavily on volunteers last year. So, I mean, we're lucky to have this Vic Health grant to pay two workers this year, but last year it was completely volunteers. Um, Moreland Council paid for one day of Jen's time and that was it. Then we had 22 volunteers. There were 22 permitted worker permits that I made up over those times. Um, and it, we were just lucky that people were based at home um, so that they could come after working at home at, and do a 4.30 to 6.30 shift handing out meals and things like that. You know, it was uh, remarkable how the community pitched in. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people can understand that story about volunteers over the COVID period and pitching in with each other. Yeah, I think I think one thing there, like the Open Food Network was um, amazing in terms of supporting us through this. And I mean, one of the slogans of Folk for Commons is we've never done is we've never done this before. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, a lot of our systems were um, very, we had feedback loops, like where we were changing and we invited people to come in and help you know, refine the systems and so forth. Week by week sometimes. Week, yeah, week by week. And also calling upon the volunteers, like upon their own capacities. So we have somebody who's great with spreadsheets who actually took that away from me because I'm not, you know, and, um, but all of these different, and and the, they're the ones that we've um, been able to, you know, refine some of these systems. And there was, a, I don't know if we're doing questions or answering questions now, but I saw Don's. There are some there in the chat. There are some. Generally, what we'll do is we'll wait. We'll, we've got Lydia here, so we might um, park the questions um, and come back to them if that's all right. But yeah, there does look like a fantastic question from for, from Don that we'll we'll come back to. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate your time. Um, so we're now going to uh, introduce Lydia um, and thank you, Lydia, for joining us. Now, the caveat that Lydia and I spoke about last week is um, that sometimes Lydia's internet can be a bit patchy, which <laughs> anyone who comes from a regional area will truly appreciate. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for joining us, Lydia. Um, and I might hand over to you to introduce yourself. Sure. Can you see me, Renata? I can, yes. Excellent. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I am extremely lucky because I'm down here in beautiful West Gippsland, high up in the Green Hills. Uh, backgrounds in national retailing and inventory management and um, currently also been farming for the last uh, nine years or so. So we farm uh, lamb. So we've got 400 breeding ewes and 170 organically managed fruit trees. Um, and the lucky part for me is that I get to pull all of that together because I am um, currently an Open Food Network Regional Food Activation Officer down here in Gippsland. So 
I um, get to chat to lots of different producers and we've been trying to just connect our whole food system um, out in this part of the world and it's just been amazing, so, so exciting. But today we need to talk about the price. <laughs> so, Renata, how, how cost-based am I supposed to get? <laughs> <laughs> so um, Lydia has um, actually put together an amazing document that we're going to be sharing in the resources email later in the week. Um, so I, I guess possibly one of the best places um, to, to start might even just be around the value equation that um, I think you explain it really well. <laughs> um, look, I think uh, it's really great. I probably haven't also mentioned that at this point, um, I'm also uh, able to work with the Bauble Food Hub down here in Warrigal, which has been, you know, just amazing. And, and the things that they've achieved over the last, you know, massive growth period has been quite extraordinary but watching those transitions and going through those growth phases has really been a steep learning curve for all of us as well um, and that's where it does come right back to you know the importance of understanding our true costs even though we are so lucky that we have an amazing uh, team of volunteers that support the enterprise we are now in a much larger retail space which does have um, overheads and costs to go with that and it's um a different model, a different scale of challenges when you have fixed costs like that to accommodate in a not-for-profit business. So we do have um, a, a, quite a wide range of merchandise. We've got like probably about a thousand different products that we sell, a uh, high proportion of which are you know fresh and um, consumable. And yeah, it's been really, um, really amazing to explore just how critical um, our ability to get a true understanding of cost is to achieve yeah. resilience in our business, especially in the volatile market we're in now with, you know, pre-COVID, during COVID, are we post-COVID? No, we're not post-COVID, we're still during COVID, <laughs> you know, all of the above. Um, so yeah, I think, I think one of the things I really wanted to chat about was how critical it is to truly capture uh, what your costs are, especially in an enterprise that's going through a growth period, which would normally mean needing access either more resources possibly more infrastructure, uh, inevitably more, more hands on deck. So either paid staff or volunteer staff, you know, however you structure things. Um, but the, the true nature of your cost is far more than just what comes in on a goods inward invoice. And in a way, this parallels to the, you know, the wholesale grower industry, because we, we too have issues where just the cost of our inputs is not the true cost of our product. So um, in a retail sense, um, just as an example, for example, um, anything that comes in and it has a specific cost price, let's, let's say oats come in in bulk and we, we buy them in 20 kilo bags and say they cost us $50. The true cost of those oats is actually not $50 divided by the 20 kilos. The true cost of those oats is the $50 divided by the 20 kilos multiplied by the consumables we need to repack them we have uh, paper bags we have uh, digitally printed uh, price and barcode stickers there's a requirement for someone to weigh and pack one kilo packs for x many hours some of that's volunteer hours some of it may not be depending on the enterprise so the outcome of that especially buying in bulk means that the investment we make to buy the merchandise doesn't necessarily give us the return in the time frame of like a fresh produce where it's a week, one in week in, one week out, it means we have to factor in the holding costs of that product, the handling of that product, the repackaging of that product. All of those things really have to be considered when we when we establish our price, our retail sale price. And again, we're not for profit, so we're not in this to actually make money, but we can't have to lose money either. So it's really trying to be as um, transparent as possible to maintain credibility with our, our market and we're rural so we don't um, have the fungibility of price that perhaps some some areas might have in the city even though of course you've got the full economic width in every um, food community um, we have uh, a strong awareness that we need to try and keep it as absolutely tight as we can just to get the food where it needs to go try and do it as cost effectively as we can but sustainably and resiliently and that's that's the challenge in scaling up for us um but it's also so exciting because this is you know such an opportunity to to get a grasp on you know what the volume potential is going to be for 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 an enterprise how we can um factor in the different types of 
best angled with the volume, um, timing, our timing to market and the planning required to get, you know, improved cost prices. Um, obviously, we're in a, a community of growers down here, so it's fantastic to be able to have conversations with people and to see the um, the potential of having a, a supply chain discussion, like even a sitting out and say, you know, we use 100 kilos of carrots a week or X kilos of potatoes a week and we peak in, you know, May and June. How about we all plan ahead that we know we're going to need 50 or 100 kilos a week and and we, we commit to try and buy as much as we can locally. So we will pay the local producers and farmers what they need to be able to continue farming. So that's usually more than what you would pay at the wholesale market. But again, it's all about supporting that, that entire food chain. It goes much further than just being a shop. It's our whole extended economic local community of producers as well as eaters, all of whom we're trying to connect together and um, improve the transparency and understanding of what these buying choices actually mean. So it's not it's about price, but not just about price. There's, there's the value equation in there, which is really we need to get so much better at, at communicating what that truly is, what that choice to purchase really means to the en entire supply chain that, that supports it. Um, and that, you know, telling the stories of producers and, and there's some fantastic resources now on suppliers' websites and on some of our online store participants, you know, the, you can click right through and, and get a blurb on, on who the farmer was, where they are and what they're doing and what's going on that week. And it's that connectivity is just so vital for people to understand what that purchase choice truly means. It's not just about $4 worth of potatoes. It's the $4 supporting the local family who's 10 Ks up in the hills who've been rigidly or sustainably farming for decades. And the flow on positive impact of those choices is just so critical. It's, um, it's all about food. It's also about that, that connectivity and the true understanding of of the value of our impact and our, our choices on our supply chain. So um, I'm probably sliding off topic. Am I sliding off topic, Renata? I think you've uh, you've you've pretty much answered most of my questions that I had for you. I mean, all I, the rest the, of it. The, I was just going to ask about the food literacy, if you want to speak a little bit more about that, because I think you've got some fascinating insights around food literacy and how that can impact your price making decisions. Again, remembering that we are not for profit, so we are always at the skinniest possible. We, we basically only try to factor in what it costs to keep the lights on. <laughs> and, um, and that in itself is challenging, obviously. But um, I, think, I think the sharing of the stories behind the food and increasing the connection between the producers and the eaters has been so amazing to watch. So we've had producers come into the hub and spend the day to chat to people or we've got an egg producer who um, Toby bought his one day old chicks, which would turn into the next season's producers of all the eggs that we sell out constantly. Um, it's amazing to watch the connections of people with that producer and the conversations that come out of that. And the, just the expression on the faces, the, you know, the, the, oh my goodness type of, you know, understanding um, Simon, one of our mushroom producers, in shiitake mushrooms on the oak logs that he grows them on people could buy them straight off the logs in the hub and it's just again you get the most incredible conversations developing and just that feeling of how incredibly lucky we are to be that in contact with the source of our food and the source of our nourishment and that nourishment is more than just even the physical food there's that whole emotional bond and understanding that again it's, it's like a, a whole chain of, of impact down the line that you just don't have when you buy the bagged carrots wrapped in plastic that you suspect may not be farmed in a way that has many positive impacts. I just, and, I, and it's not to, I mean, food is precious and valuable in every sense. It's just more that I, I think in some, some food and the choices that go along with it are even more precious and valuable. And the food literacy of understanding the quality of, I mean, nutrition can be quite complex. But I think the socioeconomic impact of our choices are not that complex. I think that's clearer and easier to understand. And I think that um, helping people see those connections and helping them understand that they are real and immediate and local is, is just so critical. So um, oh, that's, that. 
Yeah, it's great, Lydia. <laughs> One thing that I've heard you speak about before, which I think is fascinating, that um, you've got this amazing role where you're working with Bor Bor, but you also have your background being on farm and actually having to figure out price for yourself. So you're seeing it from both sides, which I think is some, some brilliant insight. And you spoke about um, making decisions around when you um, have lambing um, based on feed availability and price and how that can impact. So, you know, there's certain times of the year you'll get more money for your lamb, but it'll cost you more to get there. Um, and so just a little bit about um, from a farming perspective, how you look at that um, setting price piece? I think I think it's really interesting, especially in horticulture, because ex within the parameters of a season where we only fudge so much because the growing season is where it is and we can, you know, you can polytunnel th some things, you can extend your season in different ways, but there's a lot to be gained if you can hit that peak price point and engineer your production to hit that, that, that particular timing. Um, I think... I think that's what most producers will try to do naturally, obviously, but sometimes the cost impacts of that are, can be a bit more complicated to work through because like as you and I discussed earlier, so you may have an increase in inputs as a requirement to reach, reach that objective. Um, all of these things need to be factored down and costed right down to what is the true outcome of cost for my produce and for my product? And is that viable and can I sustain it? Um, and that's where it gets more interesting because with seasonal variations, both in horticulture and livestock, and um, I'm starting to see why not many people do both. <laughs> there's, um, it's, um, it's quite a, a volatile market where we tend to be more price takers than price makers, just by the nature of those industries. So you only have certain parameters in the existing value grid that you can fall in. And then the next level is really when you can uh, and market your value and your credibility in a different way and that's where I'd like my farming business to get to eventually and where I think a lot of other organic producers are already successfully occupying that space where you can explain why your price point is the value it is because you are biodynamic farming or you're you know regenerally managing pasture which means you can't have as intensive a stocking rate or you've got um, completely chemical free blueberries and you know, there's pesticide load whatsoever, it's transitioning to organic in a year or something like that. But these are all, it all gets back to value and your trust and credibility in your supply chain and your consumer for them to understand um, why pricing is what it is. For what you and I talked about, for me, from a learning point of view, was more that the market's able to uptake that product at different prices quite a long period of time. But by the nature of livestock production, we tend to land in a short period of time. <laughs> so it was trying to manipulate the supply and demand so we could try and fill it for longer in less volume in a more consistent way. Um, I think in the uh, fresh produce industry, the peaks and troughs of price are much more um, volatile to the beginning of season and end of season. Um, and I know I've heard growers mention that it can be two weeks early and it, it can make the entire season. Yeah, obviously, if you manage to get your stone fruit off two weeks before the rest of the market, then you're at $10 a kilo instead of eight. So um, there's huge economic impacts from a supply planning point of view. Um, but again, seasonal parameters, around. We, can, we can do so much. <laughs> you can be really creative, but there's, you know, there's, I still have to grow grass. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, no I think, thank you, Lydia. Um, finally, is there anything you wanted to mention? The, the document we're going to share, it's quite a meaty um, uh, article. Um, it's fantastic. Is there anything that you want to share to, to everyone before they go and read it? Um, that's the short version. <laughs> but um, it, it only came about from the point of view of because the inventory we're managing as a hub at the moment is actually very broad. And um, because of our system for point of sale and things, the management of it is, um, it can be a little complex because there's so much of it. That was initially drafted just so that the team could come to an understanding of the principles that we, that we use as a guide to manage it as effectively as we can. So again, all of it is really just a guide of, of, of uh, practices that are inclined to be um, or successful and I'm sure there's a thousand different ways we could do all of all of those components 
um, more than happy to chat to anyone through, through bits and pieces of it. An interesting part would be if, if any of the food enterprises that we're dealing with are, are um, dealing with GST products, there's um, a link I think Prue put in the, in the summary to the GST calculator tool to know whether a product has GST or not. But the other thing probably worth mentioning is that there's also a um, requirement at the moment where GST is only required to be charged by a producer if they are um, producing $75,000 a year in merchandise, which means that if they sell it to someone like our Bauble Food Hub, we actually do have to apply GST on the sale price, even though it's not a cost price. So there's little complicated things like that, which as an enterprise grows, um, it's good information to just have in the back of your mind so that when you hit that territory, you can actually cross-check without getting into um, the other kind of strife. But um, <laughs> um, Oh, thanks. Thank you, yeah. Lydia. It's, um, I think there's going to be a few people who um, are keen to read that. It looks like Dom was writing a few notes. <laughs> so, yeah. um, thank you so much, Lydia. I really appreciate the insights that you've shared this evening. And I imagine there'll be a few questions, um, which we'll now jump um, into the question section. So if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, and they can be for Lydia, Jen and Sally. Or if you've got a question for um, someone else in the group, feel free to ask that as well. Um, so um, I think let's start with Dom's question. Um, so Dom has said, and I think this was um, definitely um, for Jen and Sally, amazing model, love the food with dignity concept. I'm wondering how you keep track of all the financials with the two tiered system and do you use any software? So um, we have, um, I mean, we use the Open Food Network platform, which, you know, it's it's bunches of PIF. So that's one way in which we see what's coming in. And then any of the sales and stuff that we have, like with the um, Hump Day Takeaway, it's with a square reader. So we're very, you know, we're, we can really tell what's coming in. And then um, we have an account code. I mean, we're basically using Zero Excel and the Open Food Network platform. And it's just, it's ins and outs pretty much that we're able to monitor. And um we, a bit of a weekly reconciliation. It's, yeah, it's a weekly re <laughs> reconciliation. But we we have had moments where we've had surpluses with um, incoming, and so that gives us an idea of what we can support um, in terms of boxes. And now we're we're you know like at some point it was like fifty five families last year that boxes went out to. Uh, um, it's fifty four. Yeah, fifty four. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's varied at different times, and that was fifty four boxes of um, the red boxes that people who weren't paying for them. I think we had about a hundred on the biggest weeks, one hundred and twenty paying customers as well who were buying boxes that were topped up with dairy and bread and everything. Yeah. So um, and, and like with the hump day takeaways, you know, the um, we would have anywhere between I think three hundred and eight hundred dollars a week coming in on those so that could actually buy quite uh, quite a few boxes and then we had all of the things that were top-ups um that were donated um but it was fresh produce we didn't do any um shelf staple stuff or um sort of what would it be like you know food waste related top-ups yeah brilliant um does uh, are there any other questions adele have there been questions popped up in the chat no does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? You can either pop it in the chat or if you feel like unmuting and asking the question yourself, feel free to. Everyone's gun shy. I just put a question in there. Um, really? I was wondering, Lydia, could you explain again the difference between, it's really, it's a definition sort of a question, um, the difference between markup and margin? Great question. Oh, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an excellent question and a really, really important one. Just from the point of view of managing an enterprise like we, like we do, especially not for profit, we need to be clear that we can at least meet our minimum commitments. So in order to do that, um, a lot of the traditional models and how we uh, build food enterprises, we mark up at cost. So we grab a um, $5 item, we mark it up 20% or 15% or whatever we, we can is affordable. Um, in a retail business, in, in similar to like the Bobble Hub model, um, most of the events that affect that margin actually occur at the retail price and don't affect the cost 
price at all. So, for example, where we have um, supporting members who get a discount or there's wastage or a discount or anything applied to the retail price, suddenly we've got a lot less buffer in the middle than what we thought we started out at. So um, GST would come into that. So, again, comes off retail, but doesn't affect your markup at cost. So where we've got um, an example, I think we put one in the notes of six, I think we had, was it? Um, we had a cost price of $6 and we did a 30% markup, so $1.80 buff put in the middle, so they sold at $7.80. And so our 30% markup is actually a 23% um, of profit of the retail price, which I don't want to get bogged down with all the bits and pieces right now. <laughs> that only becomes important when you've got uh, things like overheads manage or uh, consumables or a, a whole list of costs that have to come out of your business. Sometimes it's just quicker and easier to measure as a total percentage of sales so you can tell if you're going to get there or not. So in our case where we have really tight margins on some things way below what you'd imagine even reasonable, <laughs> Um, in our product mix, some of them are better, some of them are very, very tight. We need to know we're still going to get there at the end of the week and pay the rent or pay the staff or pay the bills. And it's that calculation that's so tricky with enterprises like ours, which don't have a backing of, a, you know, profit or a process we have to draw on extras at any point in time. We need to, we need to structure our business so we can just pay our costs. Um, that's where working at a percentage of sell instead of just a percentage of cost markup can give you a little bit more visibility. And I don't want to say confusing. Am I confusing everyone? But um, so if you look at the example in the um, inventory management notes, the biscuits that cost $6, uh, we add 30% markup, so it's $7.80. Um, if we have a shop which costs us 25% of our sales to run, those biscuits aren't going to get it there because they're only coming in at 23%. So we need to make that up somewhere else. So I know that's um, hard to talk numbers when we're just chatting, <laughs> but if you do it on paper, it's actually not that hard. <laughs> it, it's all really about stability and planning so that as a business, we know we're going to be okay or we're going to fall short, but it's by much and maybe we can pick it up some other way to pay whatever it is we need to pay. Um, Holly, was that clear or have I muddled you? <laughs> I think that was really good. I'm, what I'm picking up is markup at cost and cost at retail are the sort of key things to have in mind. And that mm. as you scale, yeah, you need to be bearing in mind the difference and being having high attention to detail. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a generalist. I'm not really good at numbers. So that's what no, that sounds great. <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> Thank yeah. you. And again, it's all just a tool for, you know, again, trying to get that bottom line to where it needs to be and not when we're short is kind of the whole point. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you, Lydia. I probably have a question um, and it's about, there's a lot of hubs we've seen that have um, started up have, um, they only sell product direct from the producer. So um, there's some farmers markets and the like that are, orders are placed and the producers deliver based on the order. So they never hold any of the risk of that product. And then hearing what Lydia's talking about, about actually holding stock and holding that risk, how do, where do you guys see the opportunity for a, an enterprise or a hub to take themselves from um, only doing to order and then taking on some of that risk and actually buying and wholesaling um, at a wholesale price and then adding a margin? Do you, any thoughts, Jen, Lydia? <laughs> Yeah, um, we're, we're interested in this because now that we're going to have like a, a you know, the host being Faulkner Commons, um, they, we're trying to move things quickly, right? And that's a part of our communications to the, to the public, right? So we bring them along in, in our rationale for making those choices. Um, but we will have um, the Whole Foods uh, Falkland Whole Foods Collective coming in who actually will carry stock. So what we're looking at is how can we possibly diversify, like everything for us is about efficiencies in terms of, of time. 
So, you know, maybe we can have two days, like, or when there's a pickup, there's also, um, you know, there's a shop front or there's a farm gate or something like that, because, and we experimented, we actually were running the hub while we were getting online here today. So it was a bit chaotic behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, we, we tried some experiments today and everything that we put forth in the pickup sold. So now we're thinking, well, maybe we'll, we'll do that and make, uh, create sort of a bit of a story um, and and a bit of, you know, this is what's going to be on, you know, in the market stall today and so forth. So if you missed your order cycle, you can come and pick up some stuff. So we'll, we'll explore it. Yeah, brilliant. I suppose, Renata, the other thing is, I think, I think the mixed model is fantastic, but it's also great to be able to just keep that food moving quickly and that link straight from the supplier to your customer is fantastic because it means you don't have to hold it and you don't have to fund holding it if you can't turn it over in that first week. Um, so I think I think there's a lot to be said for both models, to be honest. And, you know, there's the Promcoast Food Collective, which is a collection of suppliers who directly retail on their online store, and they've been fantastically successful. They've really done an incredible job. Um, but I can, I can see how Faulkner Commons would be benefiting from having a few extra um, pick up things that yeah sounds really exciting for them so how awesome yeah brilliant um, I'm going to just move us forward now because I want to speak briefly about the resources um, so we will send an email out later in the week um, and it will have all of these resources that we've got here on the screen so um, the introduction to effective inventory management and pricing structure. Now that's the um, document that um, I was speaking about that Lydia has put together um, and Prue has made into a resource. It's actually on our Open Food Network website. So if you're super keen to see it, you can go and search for it in our Learn Resources. Otherwise we will be sending this out later in the week. Um, the Australian Fed Food Forum has some discussions around um, setting prices of producer. So again, we'll send that link out. Um, and there's some really interesting comments from different people and that dates back. Um, healthy Profit, uh, it's a simple guide to pricing food that you make or grow. And then the Local Food Cost Calculator, um, developed by scale and it's a tool that um, more accurately determines the real cost difference when buying local food. Now that one is an American um, calculator um, so unfortunately it's in um, pounds um, instead of kilos but um, still really fascinating to um, have a look at. So again we will send an email out to all participants with these links um, so don't stress about having to find them yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I very much encourage everyone to have a look at that piece that Lydia's done because I think it's a, a fascinating document. Um, so I, finally, I just want to thank everyone for joining us um, and encourage you to um, jump on Facebook and join the Australia Community Food Enterprise Network. Um, this is a Facebook group that we've started up and yeah, it's just creating a space to basically extend the conversation from webinars and events like this one tonight. And so that you can ask your questions and, and have more conversation about the topics that are of interest to you. Um, so very much encourage you to jump on there. Um, and our next webinar at the end of July will be re-engaging and retaining customers post-COVID. It's something that um, Jen and Sally and Lydia all alluded to this evening, um, looking at, we saw a lot of these, um, our food hubs really um, take off during COVID and see record sales. And then as COVID restrictions have eased, those sales numbers have decreased. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I run um, Strasbourgie Local, a hub in Northeast Victoria, and we've seen um, drops over the summer period when restrictions ease. So we've been posing the question to ourselves and we know a lot of other hubs um, and enterprises are posing the question as well around how do you re-engage? How do you, you stay? Um, you know, keep those numbers uh, and customers coming in. So I think it'll be a, a really interesting topic um, and we definitely encourage you to join us um, at the end of July. Um, so that um, nearly wraps us up, but um, 
yeah, I'd like to extend a massive thank you to, to Jen and Sally and to Lydia for being our guest this evening. Really appreciate the time um, and your knowledge um, and yeah, sharing that with everyone. I'd also like to thank Adele for all your help here this evening. Um, Adele's been my co-host and busily writing me questions, which I really appreciate. Um, and Adele, do you have the link for the evaluation? If you've got some time, um, if you can jump on and um, just give us your thoughts, I'll also put that link in our resources email. So if you don't have time this evening, you can do it um, at your leisure. Um, and so that's kind of it for the formalities. Um, we will roll into more Q&A time if you can hang out with us. Um, and so I'd like to just go back to the questions because I see that there's been a few more that have popped up um, since um, we, yeah, moved on. Um, so Simeon has asked a, um, about what percentage of your pay it forward method subsidises the red boxes at Faulkner. I'm curious how to apply this to a very public farm gate setup where I'd like to introduce a similar 50% price reduction to concession holders or those that simply identifying needing it. You mentioned dignity in providing access concession cards sometimes get a bad name. What do you think about using such a metric um, for offering discounted food? Who misses access um, when enforced and how do you help people feel comfortable to take free or discounted food? I love this question. It's uh, multiple questions. It's fantastic. Jen yeah. and Sally? Yeah, we, um, are we on? Okay, I, I think we can talk about this in, in a couple of different ways. Um, we, I mean, we're working within our community and one of, and it was within it, the COVID context. And one of the things we said was that we did not want anybody to feel desperate, right? That was, that was core to what um, we were, we were doing. And so we, we got to, like, it was very much finding out what capable, you know, what people could afford Right. And, you know, and that's informed our food with dignity program for 2021. And so we are trying to move people from food relief to food security. And so what we have as a model is 100 percent, you know, 100 percent subsidy, 50 percent subsidy and then actually being able to pay um, to pay for their food box. But what we do is we supplement those food boxes. Right. And that's because of all the different relationships we have um, that that bolsters the box. So just as a, an example, if a food box cost, um, you know, wholesale, it was, um, we'll say $20. Um, what we can do is our pay it forward could pay that $20 for that initial time. But that family might actually get maybe $40 worth of produce because we have a relationship that pay you know that pays yeah. for the milk or and then we have another pay it forward that pays for the eggs and right and there were 10 weeks through lockdown where the Heidi Museum in um, Bulleen was giving us all the food from there to um organic market gardens they've like got food gardens on site and that was 93 crates in total that we got over those 10 weeks so that's a lot of food so that was supplementing all of those food boxes as well their yeah. board approved it it was we were so grateful <laughs> Yeah, so like Andres of Melbourne, so um, which has um, departisan breads being baked on site, right? Like we would we would pick up the bread for our order boxes um, in the morning, but at the end of the day, they would give us their sur their surplus bread, and we would be distributing in the evening mm. the um, the red boxes, and it was still bread that was baked that day, you know, and the sourdough and loaves that were going in. Yeah, so you know. The, so when you handed those boxes out, they looked identical, like in, in terms of, but it was. But I think Sim, there's got, there's, it's all of ours, all of this model was developed during the lockdowns hard, like, you know, the hotspot lockdown. So it was pretty extreme and we didn't actually, apart from passing boxes, like through someone's car window or into their boot, we didn't really have a lot of that. Like you're talking about a farm gate model where people come in person and, and might donate that money it was really different to that. So like our intake was all done on phone. People like were sharing the information via their cultural WhatsApp groups. You know, we had people from 11 different language backgrounds and 
how that information was shared with each other, I don't even know, it's a mystery, but we were using the neighborhood, the local neighborhood house's phone number because the neighborhood house was closed. So that phone number was being diverted to my mobile number. It, there were all these sort of different techniques and I don't know what it would be like face to face, actually, if you're asking people to donate, um, whether it would be as effective, because I feel like in the online platform, we were always telling a narrative and that narrative was very strong. And then people knew they were supporting their own community, like the actual postcode, you know, so uh, um, yeah, I just don't know if it would translate and I'd, I'd be really interested to hear how you go in, in an in person type environment. Yeah, yeah cool. And Thank you. And, and just one more other, like, that's a great point. So like, um, we felt that we didn't actually have the resources in the, or the capacity in the team to actually um, do the intakes, right? Um, or, you know, it, got too much, it, yeah. it became too much. And also, I mean, we're, we're just doing food provisioning. Some of these families actually had more complex needs. And so that's why this year we're partnering with CIS Moreland, which is Community Information Systems. Yeah, Citizen Information Citizen, Support. Yeah. yeah. And they're doing the intakes for us. So we can refer um, and they're working with us in terms of, of keeping, you know, referring back to us who the Faulkner families are. And so then we can work with them to guide them through this process of 100% um, subsidy to being able to afford their boxes but they're just paying for the produce boxes mm. and we're, we're talking, yeah. Um, I've actually got a question just sort of like building on that. Um, the sort of these relationships that you're talking about with like the partisan, for example, are they, I'm wondering how you work out like a sustainable model on relationships that are sometimes short term, like if business can, something but only for a few weeks or months um yeah there were, been adaptive around that <laughs> there definitely were some that were short term uh, like there were some um, local growers who usually pr you know, provide food for the restaurant industry and during um the the hot spot lockdown they were selling us like things like microgreens and exotic mushrooms and things that we wouldn't normally have access to were coming through our shop at that time because they were grown in Faulkner but normally they were providing it to you know restaurants in Brunswick so actually when things opened up again that dropped off and they didn't sell through our store but we're finding recently they've come back on again so it's it's a little bit yeah hit and miss and just about asking where are you at do you need do you need another avenue for distribution or are you fine at the moment you know yeah You've kind of come back on since the recent two week lockdown. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think Faulkner has really mobilized um, as a community and realized that, and I mean, we know this from a disaster preparedness back, my disaster preparedness background that in crises, you're more likely to be helped by members of your own community than you are like from services or government mm -hmm. and so forth. And so that is a part of the narrative that we've been communicating. And so we've had other pop up um, you know, like pantries and so forth. So we know where different food is and we can refer people as yeah. well, you know, so it's... There's actually three amazing community pantries in Faulkner that have started since the lockdown that are just on in front of people's homes and are completely stocked on different days of the week. So there's like this now, people who rely on that know where to go. It's fantastic. Awesome. Thanks. Amazing. <laughs> I'm curious, Jen and Sally, you know, have you stopped to think about five years from now what you hope it's looking like? Future, the future. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> We're always thinking about that. Yeah, um, yeah. We, have, we have ground rules at times when it says, like, we, when our daughter's in the room, it's like, no, shop talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I think particularly because we're moving into this... Um, new ground of having a uh, like a co-working space for food initiatives like we didn't think I, I was thinking about that a year ago but it wasn't anything serious and now all of a sudden it's on our doorstep and it can happen we're moving our stuff out on the 8th of July so like it's really imminent and um that's so exciting because we're thinking well we know we know members of the community who are you know um from all different parts of the world who've done all, all sorts of training in cooking and things and don't can't hire a commercial kitchen for less than 200 bucks like 
for them to be able to have a space that they can hire for $25 an hour is going to be remarkable. And for us to be able to have um, just even spaces where we can all come together as different food initiatives and talk things out and, and build things together, I, I think that in five years time, we'll be really linked with the education um, sector in, in Faulkner. Already we've got um, the both the school and the kinder locally, like donating scarecrows to our garden and wanting to come for excursions and we're growing food in their spaces and everything's beginning to overlap. It's becoming a very, very community initiative, you know. Um, and I think that um, even the principal has talked about, you know, they're having building works over the road at the primary school next year. And would one of our spaces be available as a classroom? And it's like, wow, we never thought that would happen. <laughs> and we're, and we're great. Can, we ha can we harvest your rainwater for our community orchard that's going to be yeah. nearby? Like, can that be a part of your... Thinking? And he said yes. And then the head of open space at Moreland has already delivered the mulch for that. And, and thinking about how, you know, how can we work with someone who's a local landscape architect to build that community orchard? All the links are just happening because of lots and lots and lots of relationships and being very, very local. Um, so I think that in five years time, I think Faulkner might be a little food basket for Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think I also just wanna draw attention to um, the Sweetwater Foundation in Chicago because I did a fellowship there last in 2019, um, just pre-COVID. And one of their mantras is um, from, um, from blight to light. Um, I was there to really look at um, what happens when, when food systems gentrify neighborhoods. Yeah. Right. And we had, a, that was why I was there and having these, these conversations. The Sweetwater Foundation is in the South of Chicago in the Red Line District. And they use a lot of abandoned um, houses um, that they basically taught carpentry and urban agriculture and they're trying to have, uh, and they've got all these different amazing programs that all interweave. But one of the things that we were really aware of um, in, in the last year is that all of our, almost all of our volunteers um, are artists, people from multicultural community that are in rental housing. Right, so they're cultural producers. And so we have a part of our narrative, what's really important is that we celebrate diversity in, in all, all forms, like and in what grows in the garden, that we're growing culturally relevant food, that we're actually sharing, sharing all of these things because we, you know, I think one of the things that we're aware of is that we could push out these cultural producers with seeing the property, yeah. you know, property houses rise. And, and we so want to empower the voices of the community that are here now to try to mitigate this, um, the just becoming another Brunswick or Coburg, which could happen, you know. <laughs> I think that you see suburbs mm -hmm. just become like the suburb next to them as as they evolve. And I think as the housing prices go up, that could happen here. So so we're doing things on purpose, like growing bottled gourds and bitter melon. And um, and we're, we're decorating our shipping container with Karachi truck art because Pakistanis are one of the major groups that are in Faulkner. We're really trying to make sure that there's ownership here of the people who live here, who are in rentals, who love the place, you know. So um, that's a sort of another social justice aspect of what we do. Oh, just hearing your story made me um, think all, uh, so I'm involved in a, in a food hub in, in Euroa and we've got three schools there. And I just all of a sudden thought, how amazing would it be if the, because there are veggie gardens in the schools, how amazing would it be if they could actually create an enterprise and produce food and get orders from the community and then deliver, you know, harvest and deliver back to the community? I just, I don't know. I love these webinars for those light bulb moments because. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Super cool stuff happening in Faulkner. <laughs> well, yeah. And like, and the thing is, is like, because of my climate emergency background, like we made a conscious decision five years ago that our child's um, second language would be food, right? Because it's going to be something that our kids are going to need in the future, um, understanding, uh, you know, the food systems and so forth. And so bringing children along into these processes, but in a way that's fun and, you know, and innovative and, you know, it, that's when, you know, that sense of curiosity is there and appreciation and understanding all the different levels of what they can eat and the nutrient values, but in, in a fun and dynamic way. And so it, bringing kids in into those processes around, you know, trade or production or anything like that is, it's, it's awesome. 
Um, yeah. And one of our volunteers is um, mm. next week wanting to run a, a school holiday program about cooking with kids in the garden, like picking things fresh off the plants and, and cooking with them in the garden outdoors. And I think that's a beautiful idea. And also um, we, I was just thinking when we first started Faulkner Food Bowls, it was all about being a family friendly space because we'd moved from Brunswick where we went to series all the time. And here in Faulkner, there was nothing like that. Everything to belong to a group, you had to be part of a sporting organization or a religious organization. And neither of us were part of either of those and probably weren't going to be. So it was really, that was part of my motivator for starting Faulkner Food Bowls. And even just last week, you know, we always had pushes there with people doing working beasts turning over the, 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 the weeds to, to build the first rows and everything. And then even just last week, we had um, a team of Bunnings, you know, uh, corporate volunteers in making a children's playground because having kids in the space is really important to us. We've always, always invited kids in. Yeah. It's beautiful. You've got such a great story. Uh, <laughs> and I hope that others can learn from it and, and we can see more suburbs blossom in the same way that Faulkner's obviously blossoming. It's it's just a great story. <laughs> Holly's nodding with excitement. <laughs> Are there any other questions um, or anything else that anyone wants to throw out there and contribute? Silence is deafening. <laughs> well, if there's not any other questions, I, I feel conscious of making sure. Oh, Lydia's, yep. <laughs> I just think the Fortner Commons gang are the most amazing, so amazing what they've achieved. And like, seriously, you two are totally incredible. But um, I'd love to know, like looking back, like what would you have told yourselves when you were just starting out from what you know now, what sort of things would you sort of like to teleport back and like whisper in your ear and say, hey, you know, what's the thing you would tell yourselves? I just, I just, I just think it's incredible what you achieved. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, it's just grown so organically and you're so connected. And it's just the most incredible achievement, honestly. And I just keep thinking of that time scale. It's happened so quickly. It's, you know, it's got to be, you know, just the most mind-blowing thing to experiencing for both of you. Um, how that how does that relate to how you saw it all when you started what what would you go back and tell yourself sorry it's probably a weird question but mm. maybe. Uh, we, we, I think we dreamed big from the beginning because uh, when we did when that pick my project Victorian initiative was in it was a state government funding stream in 2018 we'd only had our launch two months before and we were basically just a patch of weeds and on a bowling green and had no food growing and nothing happening <laughs> and we um what we floated was the idea for a food hub for Faulkner <laughs> and that was so long ago and we got 166 votes and no one even knew who we were so it's just like I think I think right from the beginning we've had these ideas fully formed but it's just a matter of it takes so much work and so much time to get there. And so in all of that time, um, like since 2017, it's been building, building. It seems like it's happened quickly, but that's been every week volunteering hours in the garden and building relationships around the community and helping the, the, the Whole Foods Collective get up and helping all the different initiatives get up and, and building, you know, working with the multicultural community so that they feel empowered to advocate for themselves. and. And now I feel like we're just reaping the benefits of all of that work now, but it's been four years of work. You know, I, I think it seems fast, but it's not fast. <laughs> it, yeah. And also during, during COVID, I think we nearly completely burnt out last year. So I think what I'd whisper in my ear is uh, be very careful when you're working with your partner, <laughs> not to make every minute about work. <laughs> so I think we could yeah. have carved out a bit more, um, other time yeah yeah we, we, that, it got crazy <laughs> like we moved into the spare bedroom where the computer was and Sal would be writing grants until like two in the morning I'd sleep for a couple hours wake up and finish or it mental. like it was mental it was really <laughs> mental um and then I think the other thing is um I something to do about data collecting you know, and that's probably something that you might be working with because you're not for profit and so forth. Um, it seems like every partner wants to know about data collecting, you know. Um, every partner wants your data. Every, because I think that's a valuable data. thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and so 
and a lot of the the people who want your data actually have paid jobs you know in government or you know or different organizations and it's data is a currency mm. you know so one of the things that we we did at the end of last year is we made a pdf that has all of our data with bright pictures and so forth and we use we just send that yeah, you know right. <laughs> because the amount of time that we get caught up in data reporting mm. um it, it's not it's that time efficiency right it's yeah no for sure and is it still like are you two the key people are still driving all of this whole all these different no, processes and the how many We've of you gotten are, much are driving? smarter? We've gotten much smarter now. So um, a couple of the people who were volunteers that we were introduced to through Fort Worth Commons, they came in as volunteers, have now become key, really key people. So one is our um, school gardener and also runs our food swaps and feasts. And another one is the operations manager for Faulkner Commons. And so just having those extra people is fantastic. And then in the garden, Kelly was doing that all on her own. She's the co-founder of Faulkner Food Bowls with me. But then during, um, for six months last year, the Eco Justice Hub provided us with a working for Victoria gardener um, full time for six months which was amazing so we were able to second Greg from there and he just lives two blocks around the corner and is amazing so now we have Greg and Kelly as gardeners in the garden um, and so every everywhere there was one person there's now two people and I think that has helped a lot. Oh fantastic because that is just amazing I just don't know words it's just huge so yeah wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to take some time to balance a little bit with all this amazing growth or there's more ideas I bet there's more ideas what's next <laughs> yeah I feel like it's now we're just consolidating which organizations will be part of our little um enterprise here in in, in our house so it's going I think it might be called Faulkner Commons we haven't decided yet on a name for it but yeah, yeah so it'll be like an umbrella group that houses different groups um and we're yeah now just working out that model and all the logistics and legals of that because it's a bit different to what we've had before um yeah. so and and we're moving house so that's a lot about the project management that's on our mind at the moment um and then after that i think we will look at growing Faulkner commons as this farmer direct model, which we previously have all our boxes were through wholesalers um and, I, and I'm really excited about that shift because that's in line with our belief system. But because our partner was um, the community grocer and they were so embedded in Faulkner, they'd been here for five years. Uh, mm -hmm. We were supporting their presence here yeah. and they've left now. So we just it's opened us up to do things however we want to. Oh, how fantastic. Guys, it's just amazing. Wow. So, yeah. Well, Thank you. can't wait to see Thank what you guys you. do next. And these forums have been just instrumental in terms of, like, I mean, in, in learning, you know, like just different ways of working and because, I mean, we, we've been adapting as we go, you know, um, yeah. so like the stuff that you were saying today, you know, about the, um, about your markup and mar that question that came about markups and margins, I was like, so good. yeah, that's, I mean, um, Charmaine does that now and she's she's really great but I just love um, thinking about where where um, like the cost price and the retail price mm. and also you know really thinking through the hours like the pricing all of this sort of stuff is really benefit um, so thank you for sharing today um, no not at all I, I was a bit stressed out because I couldn't get into the meeting so I was flip flapping around in my house going oh my god I can't and if the webinar they're going to kill me <laughs> and you know there's sheep screaming outside my window <laughs> so uh, text stress <laughs> i've got to chill because i can't get into this webinar renata's going to kill me <laughs> so yeah sorry so i'm a little bit off my game tonight because i was a bit sort of oh my god i'm gonna miss it <laughs> but oh no, i'm sorry so, to hear that no, lydia no it's okay you were great when you though to, when you check your it, telephone it didn't show. Your slack there's, there's all these missed messages of like oh my god oh my god i can't get in <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, I'm gonna mess them all up. Sorry, so that's why even even what I was gonna talk about for our blurb, I just it just went completely out the window because I was in a bit of state. <laughs> but uh, but look, no, I think it's an amazing chance for all of us to connect like this, to have you know that chat and to reach out and and um yeah, I think I think it's really important for all of our enterprises to understand that for us down here as well, we'll, we'll support in any way we can anyone who's in this type of space. And I think that. 
um, it's important that all of these, you know, all of us realise we're just not alone. We're all connected in so many different ways. And um, it's a real strength if we can, um, yeah, make the most of it. So, yeah. But thank you for tonight. And, um, yeah, sorry I was so late and had many technical troubles. <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. Fine, Lydia. So nice to meet you guys. Hope to yeah. meet you in the real at some point. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Come come down once 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 the house is sort of in the transform in its transformation. We'd love to come down there as well. Oh, that'd be. A, we would love to have you visit. That would be so awesome. We don't trade on Mondays, but we're open every other day except for Sunday. So no, that'd be fantastic. So if you ever feel like a road trip, yeah, down the M1, <laughs> when it starts to look really green and hilly, that's when you get off. <laughs> but, um, no, that would be amazing, guys. So yeah, just um, yeah. Just more power to both of you. That's just so inspiring. I'm just won't yeah. sleep. I'm that excited. <laughs> you know, Open Food Network, it would be really great if you actually did like a bus and camping trip for everybody. Yeah. 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 We could go on the road and visit all the yeah. places. Yeah, bring the way your tent. And yeah. yeah, that would be so up. That would be amazing. You can visit all of us cousins down here. And we're only like an hour and a bit out of the city. It's not even that far. Yeah. That would be so cool. So Renata, take notes. It's got to be a road trip thing. <laughs> you can have like Ru a and I have been massive... talking about this so much. We Because we've seen some of the other people in the team have been able to get out on the road. Pru and I are like, we want to go and meet people yeah. and see things. And, <laughs> uh, and cool. I think really also should being that. able to yeah absolutely and being able to get out and see some farms as well um some of the producers would be fantastic yeah, yeah. no that'd be amazing what an idea uh, but look thank you all so much tonight i um yeah it's really inspiring to hear all the the amazing things that the uh Fort McCommons guys are doing so i'm just yeah just amazed so if we can help in any way sing out love to <laughs> love to help yeah. thank okay you. all right See you. See you. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you all. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.